Today our scripture reading will all be within the sermon itself, but you might go ahead and open up your Bible. If you have the Pew Bible, it's on page 198. We'll start with Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. We're going to go through the entire chapter to the beginning of chapter 4, and we'll just kind of go verse by verse or kind of section by section as we do that. But before we get started with the reading and proclamation of God's word, let us pray. Almighty God, by your Holy Spirit, open our minds and bodies to the recreating power of your word, that we may see the world through the mind of Christ and live in the world as a foretaste of your new creation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah, so today we're going to explore three ma- major areas of what it means to journey into joy. We're continuing our uh, study of the letter to the Philippians. So those three areas are holding to the gospel, growing up, and standing firm in faith. And we're going to cover a lot of ground, so let's get going with holding to the gospel. As Christians, if we do not have the gospel to hold on to, then what do we have? After all, we have been given um, something that no one and nothing can offer us. That's the good news of Jesus, his life, death, burial, and resurrection. And that is central to our story and our lives of discipleship. While hostility to Christianity is nothing new and continually increases, We must be ready to defend it when times and circumstances call for it. So let's start with verse 1. Paul is going to continue this train of thought that began in chapter 2, which is that the gospel is attacked frequently. Listen now to the word of God. Finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is not troublesome to me, and for you it is a safeguard. So these attacks happened so often in Paul's time that he's already written the Philippian church about this. Paul took on the role of a teacher by preparing them to once again be ready to defend the gospel from its opponents. These kinds of attacks have occurred since the first generation of Christians, so we should not be surprised that they continue to this day and will continue on. The obvious attacks like blatant atheism are easy to identify and in some ways easier to face. The tougher challenges come from within the church. Sometimes false gospels are preached not from malicious intent, but perhaps accidentally. Corrective teaching can often remedy that problem. Other times, individuals or churches create a limiting and exclusive gospel around a maybe one out-of-context interpretation from a, from a verse here or there, and they make that their flagship cause above everything else. In the worst cases, Scripture is cherry-picked for malicious purposes to exploit people. The challenge for individual Christians is figuring out which gospel is biblical and which is false or counterfeit. To do that, you must know the biblical gospel yourself so that you can be ready to stand up for it when it comes under attack. You need to know Jesus as Rich preached last week. And so verses 2 and 3 show us how the gospel is attacked perniciously Paul writes, beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of those who mutilate the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision, who worship in the spirit of God and boast in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So from studying the book of Acts, we know that certain Jewish leaders and teachers followed Paul around to either undermine his teaching or imprison him. And having been a great persecutor of Christians himself, Paul knew these people very well. And he chose to describe them in three ways which would expose them to their core. And the first metaphor is a dog. Now, I want to share with you, one of my favorite high school coaches was Coach Ledford. Great guy, FCA leader. He was a believer. 
and at the right times he shared his testimony and his faith. Uh, but every day, you know, it, it is it's football season. Uh, we we leave the locker room, go out to the to the field, and uh, we always had to be there on time. And he'd walk out, and he'd kind of cock his hat up, get his sunglasses, and he kind of just strut on the on the field like this, you know. <laughs> and he'd come over to the players, sup dog, and turn back around. <laughs> Funny white guy, right? I mean, he was doing a bit, but we all loved it, right? Sup dog. Now, you know, there's a difference between dog and dog. Uh, one of those is D-A-W-G, right? Uh, that's a kind of a term of endearment. Uh, dogs, as pets, have become endearing creatures. Have you met our sweet Winston? If you haven't met him, he loves you. <laughs> Trust me, he can't wait to love you. But back in the day... There is nothing much endearing about homeless, hungry dogs roaming the streets. And come to think of it, there's nothing much lovely about that now. And in several places in the Bible, the dog represents the lowest of the low. And in fact, it was the name that Jews called Gentiles back then. And so Paul is turning this back around on them. He's made them dogs because they were perverting the gospel of Christ. Second, he calls them evil workers for similar reasons. The Jews Paul is speaking to had a great sense of self-righteousness because they believed they were doing all the righteous things. They observed the law and the regulations and believed that was the source of their righteousness. But as we will see, Paul will argue this righteousness only comes from God. And then third, there's a group he calls the mutilators. In some of Paul's others, other letters, he writes a lot about circumcision. His criticism was in regards to the belief that circumcision had to come before conversion. When Jews converted to Christians or Gentiles became Christians, that was well, first they had to become Jews and be circumcised before they could be Christians. And Paul is saying, no, you don't have to do that. So that's why he's calling them mutilators. Going back to to Genesis 17, circumcision was the sign of the covenant with Abraham. But even before Paul wrote this, there were prophets and teachers that knew that circumcision of the flesh by itself was not enough. And there needed to be a spiritual circumcision of the heart. Barclay summarizes Paul's point this way. If you have nothing to show but circumcision of the flesh... You're not really circumcised, you are only mutilated. Real circumcision is devotion of heart and mind and life to God. Next, we see how the gospel rejects human righteousness. In verses 4 four through 8, Paul lays, Paul lays out his personal pedigree. He says, Even though I too have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss. Because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ. See, there was a time Paul based his righteousness on his birth. He was pure bread. In human eyes, he was a great success and had achieved a superior status among the religious elite. But now, this, all that righteousness that had been bestowed on him, he counted as loss and rubbish in comparison to knowing Jesus. Now, I kind of like the word rubbish. Maybe it's because I'm an Anglophile, and rubbish sounds like a charming way to describe trash. But other translations use the word garbage or human excrement to make his point here. Nothing charming about those. See, you might consider yourself to be a good person, 
born in the right family or the right lineage, living a moral life and making, making mostly good decisions in relations to others. But your created legacy will not gain you God's bestowed righteousness. And that's hard for people to understand because that means that we are really not as good as we think we are. That means we have to admit shortcomings and faults. The respect that we have earned does not mean as much as we hoped. In fact, it means nothing. The good news is that there is something better. He continues in verse 9, uh, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. See, the gospel rests on divine righteousness. After destroying the ultimate example of human righteousness, his own, Paul delivers a hallmark of the Reformed faith that righteousness is found through faith in Christ, and righteousness comes from God based on faith. This means we must be able to reject heresy when it pops up. And we must also reject the constant temptation of personal heresy, maybe best propagated by the SNL character Stuart, Stuart Smalley, right? If you remember his, uh, his catchphrase, I, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me, right? In other words, you're good enough to deserve it. We know that's not true. Our next section, joyful Christians are always growing Christians. The fancy theological word for this is sanctification, which just means to be made holy. Humans who pursue sanctification are often made fun of and called names like holy rollers. However, it is possible to pursue holiness and grow in your faith without displaying negative and high and mighty characteristics. To do that, we must understand that the process of Christian growth is relational. Verses 10 and 11. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. So we see Paul's pursuit of a holier life through knowing and sharing in Christ. He wanted to know Jesus with the kind of intimacy we looked at in chapter 1. Paul wanted to experience the ups and downs of faith in and through the life of Jesus. So if you want to grow in faith, that means your pursuit centers on knowing Jesus more. Sanctification comes in becoming more and more like Jesus, not comparing yourself favorably to others. But we know that the challenge of Christian growth is demanding. Verses 12 through 14. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. So we see Paul, one of our biblical heroes, he did not believe that he was a finished product. He was not done learning about Jesus. His process of sanctification was not complete nor did he believe it would be complete in his earthly lifetime. And so we hear the intensity of his pursuit with phrases like press on and straining forward and press toward. Spiritual growth is demanding, and it requires intentional, focused effort. There's always something new to learn or do. And if you're like me, the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know yet. Growing in faith is not easy, but it's always worthwhile. Just like how heresies or false teachings can emerge within a church, barriers to Christian growth can appear as well. Sometimes we create them and sometimes we succumb to them. Verses 15 and 16. Let those of us then who are mature be of the same mind. 
And if you think differently about anything, this too God will reveal to you. Only let us hold fast to what we have attained. Everyone, just like in life, grows in faith at their own pace. And Paul is warning the Philippians not to pressure each other to grow. God would reveal how they need to change. Uh, lately, our, our boys love watching um, reruns of America's Funniest Home Videos. And the other day, there was this little, I'm going to guess two-year-old, and we'll just say little Timmy, because that's what we call all little boys. Uh, and he was sitting on the ground, and he had this face, and uh, he was just going, Aah! Aah! and the mom comes up, and Little Timmy, what are you doing? Uh, I'm trying to grow. Uh, it's the same thing Bobby Brady did, hanging from the monkey bars on the Brady Bunch, right? In a way, Paul is saying, mind your own business by doing what you already know you should be doing. Spiritual growth does not happen when the motivating factor is to grow faster than someone else. Or as Casey Musgraves sings, mind your own biscuits and life will be great. You don't need to worry about keeping up with the spiritual Joneses. Just focus on yourself and what you should already be doing. And we'll see coming up the difference between competition and imitation. Joyful Christians trust God will point out the ways they need to grow and will pursue him. Then our final section today deals with standing firm in faith. Have you ever heard the expression, a new broom always sweeps clean? Yeah, making commitments is easy. Starting off on the right foot isn't too difficult, right? See all those New Year's resolutions. But standing firm and finishing well is much more difficult. Joyful Christians stand firm by following and imitating the examples of others. Verse 17. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. See, this is different than the temptation of competition. If you're like me, Reformed Christianity has taught us to tap the brakes when someone says, uh, like Paul does, join in imitating me. Because after all, am I supposed to imitate another fallible human being? Shouldn't I be imitating Christ? But when we study all the verses before and after this, we know Paul is not claiming to be the perfect disciple of Christ. And so we can let down some of our defenses. Paul is saying that he, like all other Christians, is a student of Christ and therefore an imitator of him. So it's kind of the, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. That is how he calls the Philippians and us to be the same. Joyful churches have good spiritual role models or spiritual parents to learn from and even imitate. The Philippians had people like Paul and Timothy and Epaphroditus and others. And there are people here today that I greatly admire and my faith grows by learning and watching you and your learning from your wisdom. So find someone you can look up to as a spiritual role model and draw strength from their examples of faithful service. But choose carefully. And we'll see why. Joyful Christians stand firm by opposing the enemies of the gospel. Verses 18 and 19. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction. Their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. Paul doesn't mince words when it comes to those he might describe as gospel detractors. They are enemies of the cross of Christ, and they grieved him to the point of tears. This is why you have to be careful in identifying your spiritual role models. You have to be on guard for anyone, and this can include a family member or a longtime friend who deliberately or unintentionally leads you away from Christ because that is dangerous to your faith 
and your growth. Finally, joyful Christians stand firm by anticipating eternity in heaven. Verses 20 through chapter 4, verse 1. But our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to the body of his glory, by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. So have you ever endured a struggle because you knew the payoff was worth it? Passing up that dessert to fit into an outfit, fighting through that cramp while running to achieve a new goal, getting through two-a-days in August for football camp or you know, band practice as you get ready for the, for the year. We do those things because we know it's worth it. As Christians, our citizenship is in heaven, but it's painfully obvious we do not currently reside there. As citizens of heaven, that means our salvation is secure, and we can stand firm in faith no matter the struggle. We have an eternal home. And so when those hard times hit, keep the long run in mind and know the payoff is worth it. Joyful Christians do not let short-term problems, no matter how dire they may be, affect their sense of eternal security. We all have room to grow as individuals, and we have room to grow collectively as a church. We can all know Christ more, and our growth can depend on the company we keep. I'll conclude by sharing a story from Max Lucado's book, Facing Your Giants, that I think describes what this can look like. He writes, I discovered the importance of healthy counsel in a half Ironman triathlon. After the 1.2 mile swim and the 56 mile bike ride, I didn't have much energy left for the 13.1 mile run. Neither did the fellow jogging next to me. I asked him how he was doing and soon regretted posing the question. This stinks. This race is the dumbest decision I've ever made. He writes, he had more complaints than a taxpayer at the IRS. (laughs) My response to him, goodbye. I knew if I listened too long, I would start agreeing with him. I caught up with a 66-year-old grandmother. Her tone was just the opposite. You'll finish this, she said. It's hot, but at least it's not raining. One step at a time. Don't forget to hydrate. Stay in there. He says, I ran next to her until my heart was lifted and my legs were aching. I finally had to slow down, and she waved and passed me. (laughs) He concludes with, which of these two describes the counsel you seek? And I'll add, Which of these two counsels do you provide? To ultimately be more like Christ Jesus, my Lord, I first have to know better Christ Jesus, my Lord. And that truly is the journey into joy. It's in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.